It was in the township of Dunwich, in a large and partially inhabited farmhouse set against a hillside four miles from the village and a mile and a half from any other dwelling, that Hilbert Waitley who was born at 5 a.m. on Sunday, the 2nd of February, 1913. This date was recalled because it was Candlemas, which people in Dunwich curiously observe under another name, and because the noises in the hills had sounded, and all the dogs of the countryside had barked persistently throughout the night before. Less worthy of notice was the fact that the mother was one of the decadent Waitleys, a somewhat deformed, unattractive albino woman of 35, living with an aged and half-insane father, about whom the most frightful tales of wizardy had been whispered in his youth. Lavinia Waitley had no nun husband, but according to the custom of the region, made no attempt to disavow the child. Concerning the other side of whose ancestry the country folk might indeed speculate as widely as they chose. On the contrary, she seemed strangely proud of the dark, goatish looking infant, who formed such a contrast to her own sickly and pink eyed albinism and was heard to mutter many curious prophecies about its unusual powers and tremendous future. Lavinia was one who would be apt to mutter such things, for she was a lone creature giving to wandering amidst thunderstorms in the hills and trying to read the great Otoro's books, which her father had inherited through two centuries of weightless, and which were fast falling to pieces with age and warm walls. She had never been to school, but was filled with disjointed scraps of ancient lore that all Waitley had taught her. The remote farmhouse has always been feared because of old Waitley's reputation for black magic and the unexplained death by violence of Mrs. Waitley when Lavinia was twelve years old, had not helped to make the place popular. Isolated among strange influences, Lavinia was fond of wild and grandiose daydreams and singular occupations, nor was her leisure much taken up by household cares in a home from which all standards of order and cleanliness had long since disappeared. There was a hideous screaming which echoed above even the hill noises and the dogs barking on the night. Wilbur was born, but no non doctor or midwife presided at his coming. Neighbors knew nothing of him till a week afterward, when old Whitley drove his sleigh through the snow into Dunwich village and discoursed incoherently to the group of loungers at the Osborne's general store. There seemed to be a change in the old man, an added element of furtiveness in the clouded brain which subtly transformed him from an object to a subject of fear, though he was not one to be perturbed by any common family event. Amidst it all, he showed some trace of the pride latter noticed in his daughter, and what he said of the child's paternity was remembered by many of his hearers years afterward. I don't care what folks think. If Flavius' boy looks like a spy, he won't look like nothing he expect. He needn't think the only folks is the folks he about. Lavinus read some, and I see some things the most of ye only tell about. I calculate a man is as good a husband as you can find this side of Hillsbury, and if you knew as much about the hills as I do, you wouldn't ask no better such wedding nor hear him. Let me tell you something. Someday your folks will hear shallow Lavinus a calling its father's name on top of whole Sentinel Hill.
the only persons who saw Hilbert during the first month of his life were old Zechariah Whateley of the undecayed Whateleys and Earl Sawyer's common law wife, Mamie Bishop. Mamie's visit was frankly one of curiosity and their subsequent tales did justice to her observation. But Zechariah came to lead a pair of Alderney cows, which old Whateley had bought of his son Curtis. This marked the beginning of a course of cattle buying on the part of the small Wilbur's family, which ended only in 1928, when the Dunwich Horror came and went. When at no time did the ramshackle Whitley barn seem overcrowded with livestock, there came a period when people were curious enough to steal up and count the herd that grazed precariously on the steep hillside above the old farmhouse, and they could never find more than ten or twelve anemic, bloodless looking specimens. Evidently, some blight or distemper perhaps sprung from the unwholesome pasturage, or the diseased fungi and timbers of the filthy barn caused a heavy mortality amongst the weightless animals. Odd wounds or sores, having something of the aspect of incisions, seemed to afflict the visible cattle, and once or twice during the earlier months, certain callers fancied they could discern similar sores about the throats of the grey, unshaving old men, and his slatternly, crinkly haired albino daughter. In the spring after Wilbur's birth, Lavinia resumed their customary rambles in the hills, wearing her misproportioned arms, the swarthy child. Public interest in the weightless subsided after most of the country folk had seen the baby, and no one bothered to comment on the swift development which that newcomer seemed every day to exhibit. Wilbur's growth was indeed phenomenal, for within three months of his birth he had attained the size and muscular power not usually found in infants in under a full year of age. His motions and even his vocal sounds showed a restraint and deliberateness high peculiar in an infant, and no one was really unprepared when, at seven months, he began to walk unassisted, with falterings which another month was sufficient to remove. It was somewhat after this time on Halloween that the great blaze was seen at midnight on the top of Sentinel Hill, where the old table-like stone stands amidst its tumulus of ancient bones. Considerable talk was started when Silas Bishop, one of the undecayed bishops, mentioned having seen the boy running sturdily up that hill ahead of his mother about an hour before the blaze was remarked. Silas was rounding up a stray heifer, but he nearly forgot his mission when he flittingly spied the two fingers in the dim light of his lantern. They darted almost noiselessly through the underbrush, and the astonished watcher seemed to think they were entirely unclothed. Afterward, he could not be sure about the boy, who may have had some kind of fringed belt, and a pair of dark trunks or trousers on. Wilbur was never subsequently seen alive and conscious without complete and tightly buttoned attire, the disarrangement or threatened disarrangement of which always seemed to fill him with anger and alarm. His contrast with his squalid mother and grandfather in this respect was thought very notable until the hour of 1928 suggested the most valid of reasons. 
The next January gossips were mildly interested in the fact that Levinis Black Breath had commenced to talk, and at the age of only 11 months, his speech was somewhat remarkable, but because of its difference from the ordinary accents of the region, and because it displayed a freedom from infantile lisping, of which many child of three or four might well be proud. The boy was not talkative, yet when he spoke he seemed to reflect some elusive element, wholly unpossessed by Dunwich and its denizens. This strangeness did not reside in what he said, or even in the simple idioms he used, but seemed vaguely linked with this intonation or with the internal organs that produced this spoken word. His facial aspect, too, was remarkable for its maturity. For though he shared his mother's and grandfather's shinlessness, his firm and precocious shaped nose, united with the expression of his large, dark, almost Latin eyes, to give him an air of quasi-adulthood and well-nigh prenatural intelligence. He was, however, exceedingly ugly despite his appearance of brilliance, there being something almost goatish or animalistic about his thick lips, large, poured, yellowish skin, coarse, crinkly hair, and oddly elongated ears. He was soon disliked, even more decidedly than his mother and grandsire and all conjectures about him were spiced with references to the bygone magic of old Waitley, and how the hills once shook when he shrieked the dreadful name of Yoxototh, in the midst of a circle of stones with a great book open in his arms before him. Nox abhorred the boy, and he was always obliged to take various defensive measures against their marking menace.